Just before class, I got the exams and got the grades recorded and um, put them into the BB office where they will be available for pickup uh, later. Um, if you guys are real good and don't start leaving early on me, I'll try to finish early so you can get over and get them before 5 o'clock. How's that? Okay. Um, the average on the exam was 64. Uh, people happy with that? I was. I like to see an average of about 70, so it's uh, first exam tends to be a little harder, so that wasn't totally surprising. Um, overall, I thought that uh, people did okay on it. Uh, the range of scores was from a low of 29 to a high, if I recall correctly, of 96. Um, <laughs> so that shows that it's possible to make a 96 on that exam. Uh, but I don't think you should kill the person that made the 96. There were several people who made the 90s. And um, I haven't done the distribution yet. I will post a distribution of grades. Uh, so you'll see where your letter grade is based on your performance on the exam. So, um, and I'll do that probably tonight or tomorrow. So we'll get that done. OK. Um, what I want to do today is go through and talk, uh, finish up talking about mechanism, and then uh, turn our attention to um, membranes. OK, so last time I, I stopped right here. And I went through the sort of step-by-step -step mechanism telling you how a serine protease works. I'm not going to go through all those steps right here. But I'll remind you of, a, of, of one very key, important step that happens in that process. And that is actually the removal of the proton uh, by the histidine from the serine. The removal of the proton by the histidine from the serine. Now, what that creates is a very reactive oxygen species called an alkoxide ion. And I mentioned it last time. The alkoxide ion is very reactive. And it almost instantaneously binds to the carbon that's involved in the peptide bond. In doing so, it attacks it. And it uh, breaks the peptide bond. That's actually the, the, the action that breaks the peptide bond right there. The reason it is. Uh, reactive, and the reason it is attacking that carbon is it is because it's what we call a nucleophile. A nucleophile is an atom that has too many electrons. It seeks a nucleus. Nucleophile meaning likes nucleus. So it seeks a nucleus, where of course a nucleus doesn't have as many electrons. The nucleus that it's seeking is carbon, and that's why it binds right here with carbon and causes the breakage of the peptide bond. Okay? Now that's a very critical step in the process, as I said. Now, the reason I emphasize this is when I talk about the next set of proteases that have, that have a similar mechanism, you'll see exactly the same thing, except for instead of having a reactive oxygen, you'll see a reactive sulfur. So it's the same, uh, almost exactly the same mechanism that's going, through, going on here with the serine proteases. I also wanted to show you a very nice figure that I was able to get uh, to illustrate um, this. Here it is. Um, this guy. Uh, this shows the three players uh, up close and personal within the guts of this enzyme. There's the aspartate, which you couldn't see on the other um, uh, figure. There's the histidine that does the pulling off of the, uh, pulling off of the hydrogen from the uh, hydroxyl group on serine. There's serine, and there's that hydrogen that gets pulled away. Okay? So you can see that in the enzyme, they're in pretty close proximity as it is. It doesn't take too much of a shift to get them close to each other so that histidine can pull that proton off of serine. You notice also here is the polypeptide chain that's in there. And you notice that right in the general area, there's the peptide bond right there. So once this guy loses its proton, this immediately reaches out and grabs a hold of the carbon that's up here. Okay? That's a really um, um, a nice figure. I think it really shows very well the overall geometry of what's in there. Okay. Now, there are a couple other things in the uh, area of the active site that I, I, just, I guess I'll just mention one, but I do want to mention this uh, one. Okay. The, um, the enzyme has specificity. You may recall, it cut next to certain amino acids. And the enzyme has to have a way to identify what those amino acids are. And the way that it does it is it has a little pocket that's actually back over here 
And by the way, you're not going to have to draw this, so don't worry about being artistic or any of that. Okay? It has a little pocket back over here that binds the side chain of the amino acid that is being bound, or uh, of the poly, I'm sorry, the amino acid side chain of the polypeptide that's being bound right here. So if this little pocket, it's called an S1 pocket, binds to the right um, amino acid side chain, in the case of um, chymotrypsin, that would include something like phenylalanine, for example. If it binds to that, then the enzyme, that's when it goes through that change of shape that brings the histidine into closer proximity to the serine and helps pull that proton off. If the wrong thing binds there, let's say uh, an aspartic acid binds in the S1 pocket, there's no change in shape. And so the enzyme doesn't cut when that happens. So the S1 pocket is really important in being able to help the enzyme to determine if it's bound to the right thing that it wants to cut. Right? Very important thing, the S1 pocket. OK. Now, um, let's see. I want to talk about, I want to go and, and actually maybe I should ask for, uh, take questions. Any questions on serine proteases before I move on to the next uh, group of proteases? Yeah. I'm sorry? So, okay, so active site is the place where the reaction is occurring. So the S1 pocket is right there at the active site, but it is not the active site. It's just a part of that, the overall thing. Make sense? Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. Well, let's take a look at another a group of proteases. These are the so called cysteine proteases. And they're called that because just like the serine proteases had a side chain of serine that played an important role in the, the breaking of peptide bond, the cysteine proteases have a side chain of cysteine that plays an active role in breaking the uh, peptide bond. And as I noted, it works very, very similarly to what you saw in the last one. In this case, we don't have a catalytic triad. We only have a catalytic dyad, meaning we have histidine and cysteine. There's no aspartic acid that plays a role here. Okay? This guy works very similarly. When the proper substrate binds into the, S, into the equivalent of the S1 pocket, it's not called an S1 pocket, but into the, into the proper binding site of the enzyme, the enzyme goes through a slight shape change, and the histidine moves up and grabs a proton. It's not shown here, but it moves up and grabs a proton from this sulfur. When it grabs a proton from the sulfur, again, the sulfur is left with an abundance of electrons, it, it, it becomes a nucleophile. It seeks a nucleus to combine with. And the nucleus it seeks, again, is the carbonyl carbon on the peptide bond. So very, very similar things that are happening in a cysteine protease as well as a serine protease. OK. Um, questions on that? Yeah. This is a catalytic dyad because there's only two amino acids that appear to play roles in the uh, actual catalysis. OK. So that's the, cyst that's the cysteine proteases. There are other proteases as well. I'm not going to go through all those, obviously. What I do want to finish with here are talking about some of the things that play important roles for catalytic action of enzymes. All right? And you've seen this uh, a little bit already. All right? Coenzymes. Coenzymes are molecules that are not amino acids that are part of an enzyme. So they're not amino acids. They're part of an enzyme. And they help the enzyme to carry out its function. Okay. Now you saw something like a coenzyme. It's not really a coenzyme, but heme. Was, would be an example of something that was kind of like a coenzyme. Remember, hemoglobin is not an enzyme, but it has something in it that's not an amino acid. Okay? So an enzyme that has something in it that's not an amino acid has a coenzyme. And if we look through this list of coenzymes, the nutritionists, I hope, will recognize that many of these coenzymes are actually vitamins. Okay? They're actually vitamins. And they play some very important roles in the catalytic action, um, actions that occur in our body. Many of these are very general type of roles. Very general, not very specific. They're very general. Okay? 
Biotin, for example, catalyzes what's called carboxylation. We'll talk about this later, but carboxylation involves addition of a carboxyl group to something. Okay? Whenever you see carboxylation occurring on, you'll, the enzyme will almost always be called a carboxylase. And so whenever you hear the term carboxylase, you can almost always assume it has a biotin coenzyme, because biotin is essential for that process. Okay. Now, there you see some of these guys that are involved in oxidation reduction. We'll talk more about those in just a little bit. Oxidation reduction reactions, of course, are those where electrons are gained and lost. And cells are very interesting in what they do with oxidations. They don't just throw the electrons out and let um, them do what they will, because if they did that, then the cell would basically degrade pretty quickly because the electrons are very reactive. Instead, the cell has electron carriers that it donates electrons to during an oxidation reduction uh, type reaction. And some of these carriers include the flavin coenzymes as well as the nicotinamide enzymes. Okay. The nicotinamide enzymes are more commonly known as NAD and NADH. You probably have heard of, of, uh, of those. Okay. Um, now, we'll talk about some of these others later, but that's the two, the two groups I wanted to point out to you um, at this time. Okay, I'll just show you NAD. That's what it looks like. And much as I know you'd like to memorize the structure of that for the exam, you're not going to memorize the structure of that for the exam. At least you won't have to, or I won't ask you. But nicotinamide um, has um, uh, an interesting structure, uh, and it has two riboses in it. Okay? It has two riboses in it. And the two riboses join together. If we look at this guy right here, okay, if I just split it off like that, that is ADP. Okay? So ADP is the byproduct of breakdown of ATP. And, I'm sorry? Well, you don't need to know, but I'll show you. It goes right, cut it right there, and then that group right there. That is ADP. So ADP is, uh, and we see ADP appearing in a lot of different things, and this is one of the places where ADP occurs. Now, what this guy has as a result of this nitrogen in the ring is the ability to carry a pair of electrons. A carry a pair of electrons. It can actually rearrange its bonds, and when it does that, it's um, carrying those electrons. Okay. There's what the ring looks like when it's carrying those. And again, you don't need to know the structure, so I'm just showing you this for your own knowledge. Um, here is the, um, here is the uh, oxidized form where it's lost the electrons. Here's the reduced form where it has gained the electrons. Okay? So um, if, something, if something in the cell becomes oxidized, then electrons are released, and NAD grabs them and becomes reduced. Conversely, if the cell needs to use electrons for something, it will take them away from NADH, which is the reduced form, and um, the resulting molecule will be NAD, which is the molecule that's lost the electrons. So, and we'll talk some more about those later on. Okay, and vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 comes in a variety of forms, as you see here. Um, I didn't mention it in that, that table, uh, because I'm going to save it for uh, the end, but vitamin B6 um, is very important, uh, as we will see later, in amino acid metabolism. Very, very important in amino acid metabolism and the movement of nitrogen in our body. Okay, and that's an example, but I'll save that for later. Okay, so that's what I want to say about enzymes. Um, I'd like to turn our attention now uh, to talking about membranes. Okay, so membranes, of course, um, as far as we know, are essential for every living thing. Membranes define a boundary between that which is alive and that which is not. Okay? We have no such thing as a cell without a membrane because a cell has to have a boundary, it has to have a barrier um, around it. Okay? The membrane is uh, comprised of a variety of things, as we shall see. Most common components are what are called lipids, and lipids are molecules that are fairly nonpolar. We'll see there are lipids that have some polar groups in them, but for the most part, lipids are fairly nonpolar. Fats, for example, are nonpolar, but as we shall see, fats do not, underline not, appear in membranes. They're stored in specialized cells. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's talk first about fatty acids. 
these guys will find as components of membranes. Fatty acids um, include a variety of uh, fatty acids that probably, again, as nutrition majors, you have heard something about. You've heard of palmitic acid. That's actually the most abundant fatty acid in our body. And we'll see why that's the case later when we talk about how fatty acids are synthesized. Palmitic acid is an example of what we call a saturated fatty acid, meaning it has all single bonds all the way through it. The oxygen doesn't count. Okay? All the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. A related compound is called stearic acid. Uh, by the way, palmitic acid has 16 carbons. And yeah, I think you probably should know that because it's the most abundant uh, fatty acid out there. Stearic acid um, is um, a related saturated fatty acid. It has 18 carbons. And a related unsaturated fatty acid is oleic acid. Okay? So oleic acid has a single double bond one double bond. And that double bond is found, in this case, at what's position 9? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'm sorry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? We use a numbering scheme to describe fatty acids. Okay? The numbering scheme um, numbers where double bonds occur if they occur. So the numbering scheme I just gave to you is what's called the delta numbering scheme. The delta numbering scheme starts with the carboxyl as number one, and then counts until it gets to the, the, the carbon of the first uh, of the double bond. Oleic acid is an example of a fatty acid, we would say, is a delta nine fatty acid. Okay? Well, there's another nomenclature that's used to describe unsaturated fatty acids, and it's one that's more commonly used. You have heard of omega fatty acids, omega 3s, omega 6s, etc. Okay? Omegas are counted from the other end. Okay? So if we start over here as the carbon number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, okay? we see that oleic acid is both a delta 9 and it's an omega 9. And for those who can't see on the, the uh, screen, because I frequently get the eCampus students say they can't see my pointer, the delta numbering starts from the carboxyl as number 1. The omega starts from the methyl at the other end as number 1. OK. So uh, an omega 3 fatty acid would be one that has a 1, 2, 3. It would have a double bond right there. Okay. Now, there's not a rapid. Uh, translation between the two, you can't subtract one and get the other. And the reason you can't is because fatty acids have different lengths. So varying lengths means that you can't do that ready conversion. So you actually have to count uh, in each case to see where they are. Now, when we look at fatty acids like this, all right, oleic acid is an example of a fatty acid that we can synthesize in our body. We can synthesize this, this fatty acid because human beings and mammals can synthesize fatty acids up to and including position number delta 9. Okay? They can synthesize them up to and including position delta 9. We'll see later that there are some fatty acids. In fact, you can see them down here. Here's linoleic acid. Linoleic acid has two double bonds. It's what we call polyunsaturated. One is that delta 9 right there, 10, 11, 12. So this guy would have a delta 9, delta 12. We cannot synthesize linoleic acid because it's got a, a, a double bond at position 12, and human beings, mammals, can't do that. It's what we call an essential fatty acid. And whenever you hear the word essential, it means it needs to be in your diet. We have to eat this guy because if we don't get it in our diet, we will have problems. All right. Now, some of these get, have a lot of double bonds. Here's one. And that has arachidonic acid, one, two, three, four double bonds. And um, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting molecule in itself, and I'll say more about that later. OK. Um, here's a table. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize the structures of these here. Okay, I do think, like I said, you should know how many carbons you find in a palmitic or a stearic, because they're, they're pretty common fatty acids. Okay, but. Um, I want to emphasize something over here. When you look at these fatty acids, what you see is that the more carbons they get, in general, the higher their melting point. 
But then you see something else that's going on here, all right? And that is that 44, 58, 63, 71, and this guy goes up um, a little bit. It doesn't go up quite as much as one might expect for 20. And, I'm sorry, this, this has, has 20. We can see the, the, the sort of spacing of, of these guys out in terms of numbers of, uh, in terms of melting point. The longer a fatty acid is, okay, in general, the higher its melting point will be, as long as we're comparing apples and apples. What does that mean? Well, as long as we compare saturated to saturated, we're okay. These guys on the screen are all saturated. And I want to point out that this is arachidic acid, not arachidonic, which was on the previous one. Arachidic acid is a saturated fatty acid. Okay, so longer means higher melting point. Okay, Unsaturated, we see that if we compare palmetto lake, which is something that has a delta 9, and it has 16 carbons, the previous uh, 16 carbon 1 in the saturated had a melting temperature of 44. Okay? We go to a 16 carbon unsaturated fatty acid, and we see the melting point drops precipitously way down to 0 centigrade. Okay? Now, this turns out to have some important um, implications. All right? One is that when we talk about fats and oils, fats and oils both contain fatty acids. The difference between a fat and an oil is a fat is something that's solid at room temperature, and an oil is something that's liquid at room temperature. Okay? So an oil is something that has more unsaturated fatty acids in it than a fat does. Chemically, they're essentially the same. They both have glycerol attached to three different fatty acids. That's, that's all. They, they both have that in common. But which fatty acids they have attached to them really changes them. Look at this guy here. Melting point minus 50 for arachidonic acid. It's the biggest one of the bunch, but it's also the one that's got the most double bonds. Those double bonds really change the nature of their chemistry. Okay? I want you to remember what I'm telling you here about melting points, because I'm going to tell you something interesting about fish in just a little bit. Okay. Fats and oils are also known as triacylglycerols. All right? That means that they have a glycerol backbone, there's glycerol right there, in which each OH group has been esterified to a fatty acid. The three fatty acids don't have to be the same, and in fact, they typically are not all the same. And we can see now, imagine how mixing and matching might affect the overall melting point that a fat or an oil, excuse me, might have, and they do. So if I put into here, for example, an unsaturated fatty acid, I would expect that this might be much more likely to be an oil than to be a fat, because we've already seen a drastic effect on melting temperature when an unsaturated fatty acid is present. Okay. Fats are very important in our body. They are the densest form of energy that we have. So when we eat a big meal and we don't burn it all off, we, our body says, I'm going to do you a favor because you might be starving someday, so I'm going to store this away for you as fat. And hard as you would like to try, much as you might like to try to convince your body not to do you such a favor, it nonetheless goes and does that because it thinks it's, thinks it's doing, doing you a, a very good thing. Fat is stored in specialized cells in our body known as adipocytes. Adipocytes, A-D-I-P-O-C-Y-T-E-S. Adipocytes are specialized cells that store fat. As I noted earlier, fat is not found in cellular membranes. There are related compounds that I'll talk about that do. In order for our body to get the energy out of fat, we have to first break, start breaking the fat down. And this breakdown of fat occurs as a result of action of enzymes that are known as lipases, L-I-P-A-S-E-S. -S -E lipases cleave the fatty acids off of fats, uh, off of the, the glycerol, that, which is part of the fat, right? Okay? And you see that the byproduct of these lipases acting is to, le is to release glycerol. Okay? This figure shows you what your body does, which is it does this enzymatically. 
If you've ever made soap, you've done this process on the side where you've taken fat and you have saponified it, meaning that you've treated it with sodium hydroxide. Now, your body doesn't have sodium hydroxide to do this. That's a good thing, too, because sodium hydroxide would be pretty nasty for you to uh, be working with. But if you do this in um, a kitchen or something like that, you can make, that's, these fatty acids that come off actually make up soap. And that's how you make soap. Okay. Now, um, I want to talk about some of the classes of molecules that we find in the membranes. All right? So one of the classes of molecules are known as the glycerophospholipids. Glycerophospholipids. That's the term I like to use. Some people call them phosphoglycerides. Some people call them phosphoacylglycerols. All three terms are essentially equivalent. And yes, I'll take any of those, but you've got to have it right. right? Okay. These guys are based on a molecule called phosphatidic acid. So let me show you what phosphatidic acid looks like. Phosphatidic acid is shown over here on the left. You'll notice that it starts as a glycerol backbone. There's that three carbon thing. You see two of the carbons have been esterified to fatty acids. But the third carbon, instead of being esterified to a fatty acid, is linked to, pho is linked to a phosphate. That changes the, the chemistry of this thing a lot. Fats are water insoluble. They're completely water insoluble. That's why we have to have specialized cells to store the fat. Glycerophospholipids will arrange themselves. If you mix them up, you take a solution of, of glycerophospholipids and you mix them up in water and you shake them, they will arrange themselves automatically into a lipid bilayer, very much like the cell membrane that you have. It occurs naturally as a result of their chemistry. Well, what's the chemistry? How do they arrange themselves? They arrange themselves so that lipid bilayer means we have two layers of these. Okay? Two layers. One layer would be sitting uh, here, okay? and we would have the carbon chain extending in the rightward direction. The second section of the lipid bilayer would have another glycerophospholipid, it would start with a carbon chain and it would go backwards to the glycerol. Okay? Now, what I've just described to you is the cell, uh, the, the membrane has arranged itself so that the phosphates are as far away from each other as they can be. The phosphates have arranged themselves to be as far away from each other as they can be, and the bilayer part enables that. This, these glycerophospholipids are examples of what I earlier in the term called uh, amphiphilic molecules. That, an amphiphilic molecule, you may recall, is something that has a nonpolar region and a polar region. Okay. Now, phosphatidic acid is only the base for making a variety of related compounds. So, for example, you notice this guy over here is called a phosphatidyl ester meaning that an R group has been attached to that hydrogen right there. Okay? An R group has been attached to this, this um, hydrogen that's on the phosphate. And most commonly what we have in our membranes are phosphatidyl type compounds, if they're a glycerophospholipid. Okay? We'll see there's also sphingolipids in our membranes as well. Okay? Now, I want to re remind you that we have Fatty acids sticking off of there. There's the R groups there. This is just a couple of examples. There's a steril from stearic acid. There's a linoleal from linoleic acid out there. Okay. And one of the challenges that cells have is that they need to keep their membranes fluid. Fluid. Fluidity. If you ever look at cells in microscopes, you'll be amazed in some cases how fluid they are, how they change their shape, and so on and so forth. And that's only possible when the membrane components are gel-like, are, are, are gel not solid-like. So if you want to think about the components of the membrane as having a melting temperature, that would be OK. okay. We can imagine, based on what I've been telling you, that if you have membranes that are fairly full of saturated fatty acids, that is, if these R groups are saturated fatty acids, 
you're going to have membranes that are going to have a, a fairly um, high melting temperature. Well, that may not work very well. All right? For example, if we had stearic acid as the main component of our, of our uh, glycerophospholipid R groups, our membranes would not be fluid enough. We would die. We would die. So frequently in humans, for example, we'll see that at least one of those fatty acids will be unsaturated, and that unsaturation favors fluidity. Favors fluidity. Now, human beings, for the most part, live in a fairly controlled environment. People work outside and so forth, but even when they work outside, they bundle up. So their cells, for the most part, are kept fairly constant, because especially on the inside, of course, uh, we have constant body temperature. And we bundle up, most of our outside stuff is kept under fairly constant uh, conditions. That's not true of all organisms in nature. The best example I can give you is that of fish. Fish live in fairly cool environments compared to us, especially if they're living in the ocean. Okay? Fish um, have uh, a, a, an altered form of fatty acids in their membranes. They tend to have fatty acids that are much more unsaturated. So when you hear people talking about fish oil, fish oil has polyunsaturated fatty acids in the membranes. And that's to keep the fish membranes from becoming solid when they're swimming around down in the cold depths of the ocean. Okay. Conversely, there are some organisms that live under very hot conditions. Very, very hot conditions. You can find them in geysers in Yellowstone, for example. And there are bacteria that live there. And when you analyze their membranes, what you see is that they have alterations also that allow them to be fluid. So they'll be more saturated because, again, they're at a higher temperature than we are. And they tend to be more saturated. And they also have some alterations to the chemical bonds to keep the thing from falling apart at the very high temperatures that are present in, um, a, in a geyser. OK. All right. Um, here's a variety of phosphatidyl compounds. So the way we name these is we take the phosphatidic acid part, which is up through right there. And we call that phosphatidyl. And whatever we attach to it is the last part of the name. So in this case, we've attached a choline to it. We have phosphatidyl choline. No, I'm not going to ask you to draw phosphatidyl choline. But I would expect, if I told you phosphatidyl choline on an exam, that you would be able to tell me what comprises it. Phosphatidic acid linked to choline, right? OK. Um, there are many different ones. There's phosphatidylethanolamine, there's phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylglycerol, phosphatidylinositol, phosphatidyl, um, diphosphatidylglycerol, which is cardiolipin. This is an unusual one right here. This is, it's cardiolipin is found in your heart membranes, actually. Um, OK. So those are the glycerophospholipids that we um, uh, are concerned with. There are other compounds that are um, important lipids for us to consider. One has nothing to do with membranes, and it's known as the waxes. Okay, you have wax in your ears. Wax, waxes are long chain um, um, alcohols esterified to fatty acids. So what they end up with is an ester bond in the middle with a long chain going to the right and a long chain going to the left. And waxes, is, as you know from waxing your car and so forth, uh, are very water insoluble. They repel water very, very nicely. And it's because they are mostly just a long nonpolar chain. OK. So we don't see waxes. And the two on the top are the, the, the waxes there. We don't see waxes in membranes. But the classes of molecules that you see on the bottom here, we do find inside of membranes. And these are known as the sphingolipids. Notice sphingo is spelled S-P-H-I-N-G-O. Sphingo. Lipid, not spingo, but spingo. Right? Sphingolipids derive their name from the fact that they are related to the molecule known as sphingosine. And again, I'm not going to ask you to draw uh, the structure of sphingosine. But sphingosine, even though it doesn't look like it, actually is sort of resembles a glycerol backbone attached to something. Remember, the glycerol backbone had three carbons with hydroxyls sticking off of them. 
And looky here. At this end, excuse me, of the molecule, we have three carbons with hydroxyls stuck on them. Onto one of those um, hydroxyls will get stuck a fatty acid. And notice that this, the rest of the molecule has a long chain up here. So at first glance, this looks kind of like a, what's called a diacylglycerol. That is a glycerol that has two fatty acids on it, one long one here and one long one here. At least it looks like that. Okay? So chemically, sphingolipids aren't that different, at least as we, <coughs> excuse me, as we start making them. Okay? Uh, we'll see, actually, they, they do sometimes make, they take some rather bizarre uh, shapes. But the basic sphingolipids don't look very different. So if we take, for example, and we replace a, um, um, uh, one of these OHs with uh, this guy right here, we make what is a, uh, what's called a ceramid. And a ceramid is something that actually, and I haven't shown you how that happens, but this guy actually has a peptide bond right there. That's an NHCOO bond right there. Okay. So in any event, the ceramid looks like uh, a diacylglycerol is what it looks like. Okay. If we take that ceramid and we put onto it a, a phosphate with some um, uh, choline on it, we make something called sphingomyelin. You may have heard of sphingomyelin before. Sphingomyelin is a very important component of the sheath of nerve cells. You've heard of the myelin sheath, perhaps, in your anatomy classes. This is the compound that makes that. Sphingomyelin is a little unusual. Most sphingolipids do not contain phosphate. Most sphingolipids do not contain phosphate. However, sphingomyelin does contain phosphate. So one of the big differences between the glycerophospholipids and the sphingolipids is that most of the sphingolipids don't contain phosphate. Well, we find sphingolipids in membranes, just like we find glycerophospholipids uh, in membranes. And again, if we mix, take a mixture of these guys and we shake them up in a, in a, in a beaker of water, they will automatically form um, artificial lipid bilayers just based on their chemistry. Okay? Now, I said that some of the sphingolipids can be rather bizarre. Here is a simple sphingolipid. This guy is called a cerebroside. There's the sphingo part of it up here but the bottom carbon has been attached to a glucose. We didn't see that happen in the glycerophospholipids. But in the sphingolipids, we frequently see sugars attached to them. Okay, this is a sugar. So a gluco, uh, I'm sorry, so a cerebroside, and there's a, a term I that you should know something about. A cerebroside is a sphingolipid. So I'm sorry. A, a, a um, cerebroside is a sphingolipid. Is that what you asked? I'm confused. Is uh, cerebroside coming from the neuron? So cere cerebroside derives its name from the fact that it was found in the cerebrum of the brain. Yep, the cerebellum of the brain. All right. But so anyway, a cerebroside is a sphingolipid that has a single sugar attached to it, usually glucose. There are much more complicated um, sphingolipids, known as gangliosides. And they also come from the ganglia that we find in nerve cells. And here's one. Okay? Now, you look at this guy. It's hard to even see where the sphingo part is. The sphingo part is actually this stuff down here. There's the sphingo part. Look at what's been attached out here. Okay? Sphingolipids tend to be more abundant in brain tissue. Okay? They tend to be more abundant in brain tissue. And problems with metabolism involving sphingolipids frequently lead to neuro uh, disease. May have retardation, may have uh, lack of development of the brain, et cetera, just for some very simple things that happen with the metabolism of sphingolipids. We'll talk briefly about that uh, later. Okay. You guys want to draw that structure on the next exam? No. Nobody wants to even think about that, yeah. Systemic lupus uh, arises most commonly from uh, autoimmune disease. Nothing to do with this. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? The last thing I'll talk about here 
are the steroids. All right? Actually, maybe I will talk about one more thing. I'll, give you, I'll get you out five minutes early. All right. Steroids are also lipids. I frequently ask a question on the exam, and students will, will neglect to, to, to think about the steroids. Steroids are lipids. Steroids are derived in animals from cholesterol. Okay. When we think of steroids, we think of steroid hormones, sex hormones. But there, there's more to steroid hormones than just the sex hormones. Okay. Um, and as I said, they're based on cholesterol. Cholesterol has the structure that you see here. No, you're not going to draw that either. But you should recognize that that's a steroid. I mean, if I were to put that thing on the exam, and I'd say, what class of molecule is that? I would certainly hope you would recognize this ring structure as being consistent with a steroid. Okay. Some of the steroid hormones include testosterone, estradiol, progesterone. And respectively, they're involved in male um, sexual differentiation, female uh, sexual characteristics, and maintenance of pregnancy. Okay. And you can see that they look quite a bit like, chemi like cholesterol. They actually are made from cholesterol. Okay. An interesting thing about these guys is that estradiol is actually made from testosterone. Okay. Estradiol is made from testosterone. There is an enzyme that is called an aromatase that catalyzes the conversion of this guy to this guy. What you can see is happening here is that we're converting something that's not a benzene ring in the form of testosterone to something that is a benzene ring in the form of estradiol. This is a very unusual reaction in biochemistry. There's almost no other places in nature where this type of a reaction occurs, where you're actually catalyzing the formation of a benzene ring directly. The enzymes that catalyze that, as I said, are called aromatases, A-R-O-M-A-T-A-S-E-S. -S -E -S. Aromatases are important, and they're actually targets for anti-cancer drugs, okay? Because there are many hormones that are, for example, what we call estrogen sensitive. That is, that many cancers have on their surface of their membranes receptors that will bind to estrogen. Estrogen is related to estradiol. Okay? They will bind to estrogen, and when they bind to estrogen, they're stimulated to divide. Well, dividing is something that you don't want a cancer cell doing. You'd like to stop that. And so what happens is if you develop a type of cancer, one of the things that they will uh, check you for to see is it, estro is it estrogen sensitive. That is, does it respond to estrogen? If it does respond to estrogen, you will then be treated with what are called aromatase inhibitors that will inhibit the production of female sex hormones um, from the male. Okay? And, those, that, and that's why the name aromatase inhibitors uh, comes about. They're very powerful drugs and do some very cool stuff. Okay. The last thing I'm going to do, and then, I'll, then I will stop, is I'm just going to show you a lipid bilayer because I've been talking about it. There's a lipid bilayer. That's what it looks like. There's the end that's charged. That's where the phosphates and other things are out there. In the inside here, we've got a nonpolar region. And you can see that very clearly here. Here's this inner chamber of the cell. And the lipid bilayer provides that protection. I'll talk more about the characteristics of the lipid bilayer next time. But I will let you guys go and grab your exams. How's that? You want to go to ALS 2011. ALS 2011. That's where the exams are. I think they want school ID. I think I need to have school yeah. ID. Yeah, okay. sorry. Cool.